Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Retro Culture presents the Hooptober Tapes, a special event for the spooky season. Hooptober Ocho, Tape 2. Boys, girls, legends of folklore and abominations of science, welcome back to Tape 2 of this year's The Hooptober Tapes. I am your emphatic host, Brett, the voice without body. And today, I will bring you another six titles in my Hooptober saga, delineating my personal horror journey through this year, 2021. For those of you who are still unaware of Hooptober, please feel free to check out tape number one, where I delineate in detail. Although, since then, I have made a few small changes to the repertoire, but I will get to them when I get to them, as well as tell you where you can find the titles I found today, if possible, on the streaming queues. Today's first title I will be discussing is the 2006 Masters of Horror episode directed by Toby Hooper, The Damned Thing based upon a story by one Mr. Ambrose Bierce, and starring Sean Patrick Flannery, Brent Strait, Marissa Coughlin, Alex Ferris, and Ted Raimi. Now, the story of The Damned Thing concerns a monstrous force devastates a small Texas town. Sheriff Kevin Reddle thinks there's a connection between this mysterious invisible force, which provoked his father to kill his mother all the way back in 1981, and he sets out to uncover and stop the so-called damned thing before it decimates the whole town. And that, in and of a nutshell, is the bare-bones plot synopsis of The Damned Thing. A particular episode of Masters of Horror that I had actually been looking forward to. I've I've been, over the past year, I've been uh, introducing quite a few Masters of Horror episodes into my system, uh, notably uh, John Carpenter's Cigarette Burns, which I had heard plenty of interesting things about coming into it, as well as Takashi Miike's Imprint, which, uh, <laughs> oh boy, that also has things to talk about, but alas, it cannot be discussed here today. But if, but for now, we must gird ourselves for The Damned Thing, based, as I said, upon a short story by one Mr. Ambrose Bierce, a, a 19th century horror author who I am a very particular aficionado of. I love that man's deathly dire wit he infuses into his spook stories. Interestingly enough, this is one of the few stories I was not familiar with when I popped in this particular adaptation. So, first of all, let's lay out the good about this. This this was, this was premiered in 2006 as the season 2 premiere of the series Masters of Horror. And what can I say about about this show in the first half. It has a good sense of foreboding early on. Uh, it sets stakes up real early in terms of that particular prologue showcasing the initial damned thing encounter. And initially, it, it, does, it is really effective for like about halfway. And then the budget kicks in, or rather the lack of budget. I admire Toby Hooper for the important films he has made in the history of horror, notably that of The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and uh, one of my particular favorites from last year, Life Force, which you can hear myself and Tyler discuss on one of the two-part episodes of the Hooptober tapes last year. But after 1986, Toby Hooper has a distinct drop in quality to my eyes. I have seen four titles from him after Life Force, and um, I really only tolerate one of them, and that would be even barely uh, that of uh, I'm Dangerous Tonight, a curious little television movie, but The Damned Thing, unfortunately, its, its reach overexerts its grasp. Particularly when they get into the specifics of the the entity that is causing this, when they decide to show it, it doesn't look great, to put it nicely. It looks like a clay face reject design. 
besides the foreboding, the, I was happy to see Ted Raimi pop up in this. I, I'm always happy to see Ted Raimi pop up in horror titles, even if usually he comes to a really bad end. To see also his his appearances in not just the Evil Dead saga, but also uh, his curious little cameo at the beginning of The Midnight Meat Train by Ryuhei Kitamura. This isn't really a spoiler, but this is a, this is a particular story that doesn't so much end as it just stops. And that also chalked up a few negative points in my personal experience. And I, I hope that... I know that the Masters of Horror saga is a mixed bag at best. There are going to be great... Ep there are going to be episodes that utilize their limited resources really well. And then there are going to be episodes that simply don't know what to do. And this seems to be one of them, unfortunately. But... I will simply end my thoughts there. That will wrap up our thoughts on The Damned Thing. And that brings us next up to 1977's The Car. Directed by Elliot Silverstein and starring James Brolin, Kathleen Lloyd. Kyle and Katie Richards are in this. Yes, Kyle of Real Housewives and Halloween 1978 fame. Also featuring John Marley and Ronnie Cox. Now, The Car concerns the fictional Utah community of Santa Inez where citizens have begun to be terrorized by a mysterious black coop that appears out of nowhere and begins murdering by running people down. After the, after the car kills off the town's sheriff, it becomes the job of Captain Wade Parent to stop this murderous driver. And that in and of itself is the bare-bones synopsis of the car. I come into this movie actually direct from the source himself. Cinemonster had... I believe in a particular list of his, it was either in his description or in a particular list of his saying that he wants his kids to grow up seeing all sorts of odd stuff. So that way, if, for example, they were asked by a school chum, hey, have you seen cars? And they could respond, oh, you mean the car? And this, that immediately sprung it onto my list of, oh, I should check this movie out. It looks kind of interesting. It's Duel meets Jaws. It's a murderous car. And indeed, that is a very apt comparison, even though... There are plenty of moments in here that are certainly very charming. Uh, not just certain cast members like John Marley, Ronnie Cox, and Kathleen Lloyd. Kathleen Lloyd in particular has charm to spare in her role as the sheriff's girlfriend, Lauren. She even has a really neat scene where she gets to cuss out Carr from hallow behind the safety of uh, hallowed ground on a cemetery, uh, which adds into the potential mystery about why the car, what is the car, seeing that it cannot trample on hallowed ground, apparently. And even then, there are choices in the music, particularly. Uh, the car's leitmotif is that of Dies Ire. Yes, the famous opening notes of Stanley Kubrick's The Shining accompany this car wherever it goes. Nice brassiness. Although it did not quite as much remind me of the Jaws theme as it did remind me of the Toxic Avengers affinity for Night on Bald Mountain. It cracked me a smile every time that occurred. And Again, a show, a story that has really solid stakes for the most of it. When it becomes apparent that bullets do not affect this this blasted car, you as an audience member are quickly understanding. Oh wow, that's that's really all these people have. How are they going to get rid of this thing? Is it just going to be a slow extermination of this town by just this wicked devilish black coop? Who knows? And while I've been very plain spoken about the the clear influences it took from Spielberg. I can also say, uh, in the climax of this film in particular, I actually noticed a film that I think took uh, quite some interest in this film. Another dust-set, stalked populist movie. A little movie by Ron Underwood by the name of Tremors. Take that for what you will. I personally came across this from my local library, although... The car is not currently streaming anywhere, however, it can be rented from a majority of the major players of uh, video rentals, especially in the U.S. So you want to use your YouTube, your Google, your Amazon, your Microsoft, your Vudu. You, you've, this, you've got yourself pretty much covered in order to catch up with the car, which I recommend you do. It is a nice, cheesy piece of 70s, not quite jaws exploitation, but it's certainly in that same vein of small town in danger. And it's, 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 a, it's a pretty neat li little flick. Take that as you will. It comes recommended to me, to you from both Cinemonster and Breath the Wiz, and that should account for something. Moving on, we are to come upon a new 
entry, that being 1964's The Gorgon, directed by one Terence Fisher of Hammer Notoriety, uh, appropriate. This is a Hammer production, after all. And starring Peter Cushing, Robert Pascoe, Michael Goodliffe, Barbara Shelley, and Christopher Lee. Uh, the Gorgon concerns the year 1910 in the central European village of Vandorf. A painter has committed suicide when his pregnant lover is suddenly turned to stone mysteriously. The local authorities seek to bury uh, the crime and accuse the young man of murder posthumously. However, his father, Professor Jules Heitz, decides to clear his name and, and investigate for himself, during which he finds that seven similar murders have been committed along the last five years in the village. His investigation, however, ends prematurely, most unfortunately. In following, his son, Paul Heitz, and his, his mentor, Professor Karl Meister, portrayed by one Mr. Christopher Lee, come to Van Dorf to investigate the two murders that, that have ensued. The discover and as they delve further into the village, they discover the local Dr. Nemiroff, one Mr. Peter Cushing, his assistant Carla Hoffman, Barbara Shelley, as well as the inspector and the residents of Van Dorf are hiding the mystery of a killer that may just be a mythical Gorgon. Now, this particular film fulfills the requirement of, it'll be my second of my Hammer Pictures Discussed so far, while I will get to my first one down the line when me and Tyler again do another Hooftober podcast where we will be discussing another Terrence Fisher joint, The Curse of the Werewolf. Very good film, spoiler alert. But I managed to find this uh, streaming on Hoopla, uh, my local library streaming service, and I was actually fairly impressed with this film. Uh, First of all, let's get on to the casting highlights. Peter Cushing, it's always nice to see him, even though he's... He has very... He's not as indelibly characterized as he has been in previous Hammers in this. He's more just, oh, the Doctor doesn't want to get involved. So he's very much only along for the ride, but barely. Meanwhile, you have uh, Michael Goodliffe as the Professor Jules Heights, who is the first one to question the the actions of the village of Van Dorf authorities and pursue his own investigation of his son's mysterious death involving uh, the late stony women all around the area, which, yeah, how, how would you... <laughs> it, it's something when these villagers are like, oh, let's cover this up. They just turned to stone. It's fine. No one will think about that. But Michael Goodliffe's role, he is very, very effective and affecting. He has this conviction about him when he enters the scene saying that he he knows that they are giving his son short shrift and therefore he's going to bring his own investigation about and his final scene is incredibly wrenching when you see this man who he knows he is he has come to a wretched end but he's still going to do his damnedest to at least alert others around him of the of the dangers ahead which is pretty damn well handled, and especially the makeup they apply to him, uh, given that he, uh, unfortunately, gets uh, that nice little uh, flirt flirtatious look from a, from a Medusa. Well, a Gorgon, forgive me. And, of course, there's Sir Christopher Lee, the most baddest ass to ever badass. And he is also very rarely uh, shown in this film for the first half. Like, he's only in one scene in the first half, and then the, the final act was done, and then he rolls into town like, all right, I'm going to make sure you don't screw this up, boy. Uh, I am not, I can't really give much emphasis to Robert Pascal, who is our default protagonist after Michael Goodliffe leaves, and he's he's fine. He, he looks vaguely like Richard Thomas, and he does what he can, uh, trying to woo Barbara Shelley because she's mildly cute and blonde, and hey, it could be nice waifu material. But I also want to point out... Uh, uh, this is, of course, a Hammer production from 1964, and it's still got that traditional gothic mood about it. The settings are very richly described, and I actually want to point out the Gorgon effects. Uh, even though uh, those of us who've been watching movies a while can sort of see the strings, so to speak, we can... Putting these uh, particular Gorgon effects under HD TV scrutiny is sort of a, a wretched affair, because I don't want to point out just the the ham-fistedness of certain effects, but I actually want to appreciate how 
how well they utilize their limited actions. How it's apparent that the the snake heads in the Medusa in the Gorgon figure are clearly either on springs or they are on like a spring mechanism, which prompts them to move very slightly when given their little bit of screen time. Which again, there are only like three scenes where the Gorgon is actually given like adequate little glimpses, and not until the very end is when you get the the full effect, so to speak. Will you? Uh, yeah, I, I personally found this film extremely charming and really, really affecting. Uh, Christopher Lee and uh, Michael Goodleby, of course, put this on a pedestal of sorts in terms of richly engrossing hammer horror. So that'll... I'll leave it there. Uh, as I said, I personally viewed this on Hoopla, although it is also available in HD via the Plex service if you perhaps ascribed to that, as well as with ad breaks on the Roku channel, Tubi TV, Redbox, and Dark Matter TV, a service I have not yet heard of. Perhaps it's a uh, competitor to Shudder, like the Dark Universe, is how I'm getting that impression, but ah, The Gorgon, definitely worth a recommend in my opinion, it's, it's worth checking out. And that will bring us to our next entry, that being 1962's Tales of Terror, directed by Roger Corman, written by one master of uh, suspense, Richard Matheson, and starring the talents of Vincent Price, Peter Lorre, Basil Rathbone, Joyce Jameson, Leona Gage, Maggie Pierce, David Frankham, and Deborah Paget. Now, Tales of Terror is a is a anthology collection of three distinct adaptations of Edgar Allan Poe stories directed by one Mr. Roger Corbin of course now the first tale uh, described is Morella concerning the recently 20 and something years old Lenora returns to the derelict house of her estranged father Locke somewhere in the moors of England her mother Morella died after giving birth to Lenora, and Locke still grieves and blames Lenora for the death of his beloved wife. Lenora manages to find the corpse of Morella on her bed in the house, and Locke tells that he could not leave her in a coffin six feet under. Afterwards, Locke begins to attempt to make amends for abandoning Lenora, but something supernatural is about, and grave consequences are in order. Uh, the second tale is The Black Cat, loosely adapted from that particular story, as well as many elements of the Casco Amontillado, tossed in for good measure, concerning the adventures of a one drunkard Montreso Herringbone, an abusive man that spends the money that his wife Annabelle earns by uh, drinking uh, wine in the local taverns. He also has a dire hatred for her pet black cat, just for good measure. One day, Montresor meets the connoisseur of fine wines, Fortunato Lutresi, portrayed, of course, by one Mr. Vincent Price, and he disputes his knowledge with him and challenges him to many drinking games. After one such game, Fortunato brings Montresor home and manages to woo Annabelle. But when Montresor Horingbone discovers that his wife is having a love affair with Fortunato, he plots a scheme to seek his own revenge. And the final entry in the Tales of Terror triptych is that of the case of Monsieur Valdemar. The wealthy Ernest Valdemar, Vincent Price, is terminally ill and in great pain. He hires the celebrated hypnotist Mr. Carmichael to relieve his pain and asks his beloved wife Helen and his doctor, Dr. James, to get married to each other after his demise. However, Mr. Carmichael has a nefarious plan and as he controls his mind, Valdemar's body doesn't die, but his soul is, remains trapped in his body. Carmichael corners Helene and tells her he will only let Valdemar go if she marries him instead of the good doctor. But this particular turn of events brings about tragic consequences. And that is a decent enough summary for 1962's Tales of Terror. As I mentioned, it is one of the entries in the Roger Corman-produced Poe Cycle. And certain eagle-eared listeners will no doubt remember that last year, I also partook in a Roger Corman post-cycle movie featuring Vincent Price, that particular title being 1964's The Tomb of Lygea, a really, really neat movie. You can listen to it on uh, the 
You can listen to our review, myself and Tyler's, on the two-part episode I recorded with him for the Hooptober tapes. Feel free to check it out. But today we are talking about Tales of Terror. Tales of Terror owing a lot, obviously, to the horror anthology uh, structure of films. Very popular at this time, somehow. You actually, take that back, it, the anthology film remains popular today. I mean, look at the fact that the VHS movies keep getting made. We just had one released, but it was VHS 1994. I need to catch up with that one. I heard interesting things, but the horror anthology is always an interesting subgenre to tackle in horror because you're always going to get something different, usually. I have seen a few... I have seen the rare anthology film where all the stories weirdly felt the same. Although usually that uh, implies a like shared character of sorts. But usually if you make an anthology right, there is usually different directors handling different segments. But that is not so with this particular film. This is a Roger Corman production through and through. The only thing that slightly changes is the casts. But then again, not totally. Because the headliner of this movie is, of course, Vincent Price. A magnanimous slice of ham that he is. I personally love Vincent Price. He's one of my favorite horror character actors. He's one of my, I, I take that back. He's one of my favorite character actors, period. I miss that man. I remember actually during the cinephile trivia night I host, I begged them to allow me to play the Vincent Price card one night so I could do his filmography. Surprised to no one, I was the one who won, but it turns out the way I can win is just bring it back in time, because... I am not as thoroughly familiar with the modern peoples as I am with very, very old fogies. But... But coming back to the film... Uh, of course, Vincent Price plays the three different... Le is the is the one solid piece of connective tissue besides the fact that all three stories were directed by Roger Corman and written by one Mr. Richard Matheson, who is no stranger to working with uh, Vincent Price and Roger Corman, because not only did Richard Matheson pen quite a few of the other entries in the Poe cycle, but his novel, his most endearing work, I Am Legend, was adapted for the first time in 1964, starring one Mr. Vincent Price, that being The Last Man on Earth, a film that I am actually a very big supporter of. If you, you really have no excuse to not check that movie out, dear listeners, because that movie's in the public domain. It, you can find it anywhere, but there's plenty of good-looking copies out there to partake in. It's, it's actually my favorite rendition of the I Am Legend novel, simply because it, it's Vincent Price playing, playing the role of Neville. And he just owns that so thoroughly. But I'm getting off track. I keep talking about other things, uh, tangentials. When I should most definitely be talking about the film itself, which is very interesting. Uh, let's focus on one of the the specific brands of co-stars we have in here. We have, of course, typical Roger Corman background actors, the likes of Joyce Jameson and... I believe uh, Robert Frank has been something else, but I can't remember off the top of my head. However, I am also apt to point out the presence of one Mr. Basil Rathbone, possibly most known to history for po for participating in one of the most notorious and iconic cinema sword fights between him and Errol Flynn in The Adventures of Robin Hood, but to me and my personal family, he is best known for being one of the iconic portrayers of Sherlock Holmes in several universal wartime movies they made, they cranked out during World War II. He, he is really excellent, and he is so good at playing nefarious. He's great at playing this dark and dry sort of Sherlock Holmes, but as as villains, he also excelled. I mean, Guy of Gisborne is iconic for a reason. And here, as Mr. Carmichael, he is just slimy as can be, in more ways than one once the short wraps up. And also of note is one Mr. Peter Lorre, best known for his, his very easily imitated way of talking, yes. But uh, this is the very, very late period of Peter Lorre's life. He is quite round, uh, possibly drunk, actually on set. It is impossible to know. I know he did fight a morphine addiction in part of his life, but I thought he kicked that by the time World War II rolled around. 
But he he's still a lot of fun playing an actual drunk in the film. So it makes sense he he's looking and acting a bit drunk that way. So why am I complaining? But as I keep dancing around, the main attraction of Tales of Terror is the voluminous performances of one Mr. Vincent Price. The ability of his to modulate his performances are just sublime. Uh, from the fact of, uh, let's return to the Peter Lorre segment, uh, The Black Cat, where he plays this ridiculous fop by the name of Fortunato Lutresi, who is this... In a slight diversion from the rest of the film, which takes it self relatively seriously, the Black Cat plays with comic portrayals very often. I mean, just look at the way Vincent Price swishes and has to imbibe his wine with his lips all pursed and swishing, 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 swallows. Like, ah, yes, my friend, it is a perfect cabernet. It's like, ah, yes, I love you, my good man. But uh, one of the things I want to point out specifically is his performance in the first story, Morella. One of the lesser known Poe works, but when Price first enters, he is this incredibly moody persona, very reminiscent of, let's say, Heathcliff and uh, Maxim de Winter, as portrayed by Laurence Olivier in Alfred Hitchcock's Rebecca. He has this incredible dark mood surrounding him when he first comes into the picture, dour and condescending in that drunken brood of sorts that many in Gothic literature came to assume. But as the segment continues, this particular facade falters, and he is allowed, Price is allowed to portray a sparing kinship with this new daughter who has come back into his life. And once the story approaches its climax, his portrayal of this particular man going through the regular ringer of madness and mortality are just sound as can be. His his toned cries going from shocked to terrified to helpless in mere seconds. I just absolutely adore Vincent Price's work in this film, and that's why I am going to take my opportunity to Tales of Terror. It is not currently streaming on any of the key three or four or five streaming services. However, Tales of Terror is available uh, to stream via DirecTV VOD, as well as the Epix add-on to Prime Video, and the Paramount Plus platform, which is also available as an add-on for Prime Video. So there, and it is also available to rent from Amazon, Microsoft, and Vudu. So, there we go. I do recommend that my audience check out Tales of Terror. While it is not thoroughly terrifying, it is very engrossing and very well put together, uh, being a Quorum production written by Richard Matheson. So, one cannot really expect any less, perhaps. And actually, that brings us to our next little property to discuss. That would be 1971's Lady Frankenstein, directed, co-directed by one Mr. Mel Wells and Aureliano Lupi, and starring Joseph Cotton, Rosalba Neri, Paul Muller, Riccardo Pizzuti, Marino Mazze, and Mickey Hargitay. The story, of course, concerns the Baron Frankenstein in this film, portrayed by one Mr. Joseph Cotton, who is progressing with his most notorious and well-documented experiments most successfully with the aid of some unscrupulous grave robbers, as well as his confidant, Dr. Charles Marshall, portrayed by Mr. Paul Muller. However, in the midst of these activities, he is suddenly gifted a visit by his now-adult daughter, Tanya, herself a student of the sciences, this film portrayed by Rosalba Neri. She confesses her awareness of the good Baron's most illicit of endeavors and actively tells her father that she is willing to give him help if only he would ask for it. The next night, however, the Baron is unfortunately killed by his very creation, which sets out of the castle to commit its own series of mayhem in the surrounding village. With the aid of Dr. Marshall, and seeking to mislead the local constable, portrayed by Mickey Hargitay in here, Tanya sets about creating a new specimen, but with a brain of learning installed as opposed to the warped one that is currently stalking grave robbers and aching for vengeance against its masters. And that is the summary for Lady Frankenstein, a film that only came to me because this particular film, one of my particular 
add-ons to this year's Hooptober is for the entire run of my Hooptober, Mystery Science Theater has always been there. I've always made time to watch a Rift property. And Lady Frankenstein is actually a slight change-up for me. I have covered Rift Tracks movies, of course, on Hooptober. And I have, of course, covered Mystery Science Theater titles on here with and without Rifts. But this year, I am adding a new party to the list, however limited their stock may be, and that would be that of the Incognito Cinema Warriors XP crew, led by one Rick Wolf, a Kansas boy. The Incognito Cinema Warriors are a fan project, and actually you know, their own separate entity by now, uh, currently rebranded as Robot Co-op. But they were a Mystery Science Theater-influenced group who basically took the MST3K formula of, oh, take a storyline where some random dude is trapped in a movie theater with some robots and they snark on some some movies of questionable quality, but trade out uh, standard 50 sci-fi for zombies. Yes, this is a Resident Evil-inspired comedy outfit, and they, they wear this on their shoulders quite obviously, especially in the fact that one of their early... In the second season, they ended up reviewing Resident Evil Retribution, which had only just come out. And as soon as they shifted their views toward riffing video games, one of the very first things they did was actively riff the remaster of Resident Evil on the GameCube and PS4. And they are pretty nice boys. I actually... For this particular review, I actively sought them out online and from their online store purchased... Uh, both volumes of their riffing series, uh, that at least of movies. Since 2017, they have sort of shifted away from the Incognito Cinema Warriors into more of the robot co-op simply because they posted most of their stuff on YouTube and YouTube is not very kind, especially when it comes to content ID and the algorithm to allowing them to do their jobs and get, get rewarded for their duties. So... They have more shifted into a slightly different market. And all power to them. I am all for them doing what they do because I enjoy well, what they do. I have enjoyed several of their roasts of Resident Evil games, various indie games, the Nintendo Switch. Hell, they even had a brief crossover with the Angry Video Game Nerd a few years back. That was interesting. But jumping back to the film itself, which I did watch Rift, this film actually has a connection to the previous film being that there is a Roger Corman connection in that this particular movie, I believe, was distributed by New World Pictures under Corman and is co-directed by a Corman alum, one Mr. Mel Wells, probably best known to the world as playing Mr. Mushnick in the original Little Shop of Horrors featuring a young Jack Nicholson. And also, to me, uh, in a Mystery Science Theater connection, probably known for his appearance in Wizards of the Lost Kingdom 2, uh, notably riffed on season 11 of Mystery Science Theater, the first Netflix season. Oh, what an episode that was. But Lady Frankenstein. It is very much an Italian Frankenstein exploitation. There was a lot of that. Uh, Italian horror of the late 60s, early late 60s up through the 70s, was very much about exploitationing something, be it nuns, be it zombies, be it whatever they had. And there was no shortage of Frankenstein riffs and ripoffs of this time. However, this one managed to grab an, an interesting cast of characters, notably that of uh, Joseph Gotten, uh, formerly of Orson Welles' Mercury Theater crew. Um, people probably recognize him from the likes of Citizen Kane as well as the Magnificent Ambersons, and one of my all-time faves, not a Wells production, but a Wells movie nonetheless, uh, that of Carol Reed's The Third Man, an excellent, excellent film noir to end all film noirs, possibly. And it, it was neat to see him pop up in here, one of his later roles, Joseph Cotton, and uh, also attached, you have Mickey Hargitay, yes, the father of Mariska and the... Husbando of one Miss Jane Mansfield. I don't have much experience with Nicky Hargitay. I know he played Hercules once, but I don't think I've caught up with that particular film yet. I need to. And this film is actually pretty good overall. I know of several people in my circle who actively enjoy this movie as quite delightful. 
It's a little bit of sexploitation, a little bit of Italian ripoff, and just a little, just the tiniest eking of class thrown in with the presence of people like Joseph Cotton to really add something more to this traditional horror film of the 70s. And it's it's got a lot going for it. Uh, not just the uh, beautiful eye candy in the form of Rosalba Neri. Wow, she was, she was quite the specimen. Good God, she had those big, just the big eyes uh, that you would see in plenty of these European type of giallo adjacent films. She, she really cut some mustard in this film and uh, her interactions with Paul Muller as Dr. Charles Marshall where she is ending up just <laughs> I would say she's seducing him to the dark side but the dude is already putting to the, together corpses into new bodies and putting brains inside them to revive them so it's not like he's actually got any moral high ground on her when he, she finally comes around saying hey I want to make a new one he's like oh I'm unsure about this and it's like dude he, Really? This is the moral event horizon? Making another one? <laughs> you seem to have already crossed the Godzilla threshold, my dude. But it's, it's, it's plenty of fun. They're, uh, the riffs that the ICW XP guys get out of this are very, very funny. Especially there's one particular running gag involving, Oh, there's no stairs! Simply because it's an easily spotted set. So there's plenty of that and just... They bring a different brand of humor to this than Mystery Science Theater did. Mystery Science Theater, as much as I love it, is very of its time, especially during the classic period. Uh, a lot of jokes um, simply do not age well, in my opinion. There are several from the early years that I cannot return to, notably that of Phase 4, and a few other shows where they decided... where um, homophobic uh, jokes were not off the table at that point, so... But luckily, the, the boys in ICWXP cut that out. Just about. There is still some ribbing in that direction, but it's never uh, blanket phobic statements that too many comedies of the 90s and 80s were prone to. And yeah, I'm actually going to give a recommendation to Lady Frankenstein. It is quite easily available. It's practically in the public domain, so you can find it on YouTube. As well as it is rentable and purchasable from Amazon Video, and it's supposedly f streaming free in SD on the Film Detective streaming service. Another, f another streaming service I'm unaware of. Well, yeah, I give a recommend to Frankenstein, La La Frankenstein's daughter, Lady Frankenstein. I'm getting confused with other 60s exploitation movies. Like I believe it was. It was Billy the Kid meets Dracula. I believe it was Jesse James meets Frankenstein's daughter was that particular installment in that weird 60s style. Of, hey, let's mash up the old West and uh, gothic horror. It's, like, eh, it's not a, the worst idea I've heard, but certainly Lady Frankenstein is definitely worth a watch at the very least. Check it out. And purchase the ICW XP seasons if you would like. The, the first season is only three episodes. I believe the other two they covered were another Mickey Hargate film, uh, The Bloody Pit of Horror, as well as, oh, what was the other one? I Oh, it was Werewolf in a Girl's Dormitory, a movie which I own unriffed on Severin Blu-ray, which <laughs> I will eventually get to that one too. I'm debating when I'm going to hold that for next, next year, Hooptober, when I'm just going to watch it in the off time and share it with my bestie to torture him. I'll figure it out as I go along. And that, dear listeners, brings us to our sixth and final title I will be discussing today. Another pick from the Corman Poe cycle. That being 1963's The Raven. Starring Vincent Price, Peter Lorre, Hazel Court, Jack Nicholson, and Boris Karloff. Now, The Raven concerns the ex-sorcerer Dr. Erasmus Craven played by Vincent Price, who does not belong to the Brotherhood of Magicians. He lives his life in his great castle with his daughter Estelle while grieving the loss of his long-beloved wife Lenore. But one night, as he is curling up with a nice goblet of warm milk, a raven knocks on his window, and as soon as Craven lets this bird in, he realizes it is a transfigured magician by the name of Dr. Adolphus Bedlow, played, portrayed in this film by Peter Lorre, who has been turned into a raven after challenging the 
powerful sorcerer, Dr. Scatabus, to a wizard's duel. Now, after making a potion to turn Dr. Bedlow back to human form, Bedlow informs Craven that he has seen Lenore, or at least someone in his wife's image, wandering the halls of Dr. Scatabus's castle, having just flown from there. Craven decides to go and investigate in his coach with Bedlow to visit Dr. Scatabus, but Estella and Bedlow's son Rexford, portrayed by Jack Nicholson in this film, decide to attend with them. Upon arriving, they find the good Dr. Scarabus rather amicable, and he invites them to stay for the night, having trekked all this way, after all. But as the night proceeds, tensions and deceptions take their toll on their stay, and eventually lead to more magical mischief between Craven, Bedlow, and Scatabus. And that is the summary for the Raven that I'm going to leave off with. Now, no doubt, listeners will recall that my bonus segments for my personal Hooptober list only made room for one Vincent Price film in the, well, requirements I've added to myself. Well, mood being what it is, I actually decided to modify that rule and added a second Vincent Price to my requirements. Therefore, slight rule modification. There are now two Vincent Price movies on this year's Hooptober because... I felt like it, and there's... I Actually, I feel I don't need an excuse to add a Vincent Price movie to my horror movie-watching ceremonies. So there. So we're going to start with 1963's The Raven. Let's start with the way Richard Matheson and Roger Corman decided to adapt the titular poem by Edgar Allan Poe. Now, it occurs to me, a an educated man, that an authentic beat-for-beat slavishly devoted to the text adaptation of the raven would not make much more than a curious short film seeing as the poem itself is just oh, i was sitting here lonely then a raven flew in and bothered me and sat upon the bust of my dead wife i curse at thee raven and i'm trapped here with you you moron that is Mm, you can maybe stress that out to a 15-20 minute short film at best. So what did Corman and Matheson decided to do? They turned this reminiscence on loss and an annoying freaking bird into a movie still featuring uh, a character going through a stage of grief, but it's not easily discernible, who is indeed bothered by a very annoying black feathered bird only to add in wizards. As I wrote in my Letterboxd review for this particular film, uh, Corman's sense of humor in particular is very reminiscent of the time it was released, the 1960s, the heyday of Hanna-Barbera properties, such as the Flintstones, the Jetsons, and at the end of the decade, Scooby-Doo would come out and create a legacy all of its own. But uh, Corman, in order to not to alienate any of his audience, uh, preferred to paper over any excessive gruesomeness with giggles. And The Raven is easily the silliest film in the Poe saga so far. And this trades in anything resembling mood for mugging and cartoonish slapstick. But I must say, the, the main trio of Karloff... Price and Laurie do work well with each other. Price and Laurie having this almost boobish, bumbling boob interactions, the like of a Bud and Lou, Abbott and Costello. And then there's Karloff being all smarmy and welcoming in a in some in something reminiscing that of his performance he gave in in Ulmer's The Black Cat way back in '34, co-starring Bela Lugosi. There are still things to talk about in this movie, though, as silly as it is. Let's, for example, focus on one Mr. Jack Nicholson. Now, Jack Nicholson is no stranger to the work of Roger Corman. Hell, I mentioned earlier that he appeared in The Little Shop of Horrors, the original one from 1960. And this is another one where he just slides right in there to fill a role, this time playing the, the son of Peter Lorre, Interesting casting choice. I I don't quite see it, but that certainly was a choice, Roger. 
But I must point out the introduction to Nicholson's character. A very rudimentary of, oh, there's a knock at the door. Look at him. He's here. My son. Oh, this is my son. Uh, Rexford, introduce yourself to the nice lady. And what we get in that moment is enchanté, my, my chair. To hear Nicholson not even attempt a French affect for that opening line is... It sort of made me ascend out of the movie, out of the atmosphere, and realize, oh, wow, that certainly was a choice that, that this actor just made. Holy mackerel. Ah. Uh, but I also want to point out, uh, before we wrap up here, um, the climax of The Raven. Now, as I said, this is the raven, but extended out by adding in magic and wizardry. And I would be remiss to not point out that the climax of the raven, it is hard not to notice the similarities between 1962's The Raven and that very same year's Disney property, The Sword in the Stone, which also had a very comic riff on the wizard's duel trope. But Corman is a lot cheaper and a lot more openly campy in his attempts at such. It, hell, part of it culminates with Vincent Price sitting on a chandelier tossing eggs down on Boris Karloff. That is the level of wizard's duel we're dealing with. There is no, The closest we get to danger is when Boris Karloff gets sick of Price's stick and throws a spear at him and seemingly gets rid of him only for, oh, shenanigans to ensue even further. That is the type of movie we're dealing with. Just... It, Picture the image of Vincent Price sitting in a chandelier, just tossing eggs on top of Boris Karloff and his flat skull cap. That is basically the tone of this film. And indeed, it I did I certainly enjoyed my time with it. From Nicholson's amazing delivery of French phrases to Karloff's delightful smarminess to the immortal Vincent Price doing what he does best, just playing his role to a T. And so I guess that'll wrap up my my choices for this evening. Uh, if you would like to watch The Raven, I personally watched it from the Region B Arrow set, uh, Six Gothic Tales, starring Vincent Price. But in Region 1, it is very easily available on Amazon, Microsoft, and Vudu for rental and purchase. So... There, if you wish to check out Roger Corman's The Raven, it is at your disposal. And that will actually wrap us up for this particular tape in the Hooptober tapes. I thank you for listening. This has been Brett, the voice without body. And I do hope you have a most happy Hooptober. And watch some spooky movies out there this month, dear listeners. Happy hunting. Good night.